I'm sitting in a wobbly folding chair, a bulbous red nose dangling from an elastic string around my neck, watching two clowns perform. Something is wrong. These clowns are angry. Not pretend clown angry, real angry. I'm getting nervous, not fun nervous, real nervous. Then one clown calls another clown a cunt, and the entire world comes to a screeching halt. This, this is clown college. <laughs> clown college is not a traditional college per se with a big top campus, professors in ill-fitting tweed jackets and oversized red shoes, and students playing hacky sack on the lawn instead of studying for their seltzer spray bottle 101 final. It is rather a hodgepodge of adults unceremoniously gathered in a dance studio that has the musty, heavy scent of a middle school locker room, located on a side street in Glendale that is frequently littered with shattered glass from cars that have been broken into. I am attending clown college to get in touch with something I feel I have lost. A sense of play, a sense of wonder and freedom. This is going to be so fun. On the first day, I am chastised for wearing jeans. Clown legs, it seems, deserve to be sheathed in something more than mere denim. Our instructor, my chastiser, is a young man with a thick tangle of curly black hair named Zach. His hair isn't named Zach, he is. <laughs> Zach is not the name of a clown. It doesn't have the jovial ring of a bingo or a pogo or a glitter bug. But Zach is immediately disarming, at once playful and welcoming, but equally mysterious and slightly frightening. The kind of person who refers to toes as foot fingers and then criticizes you for questioning his logic. The students are a cross-section of Los Angeles performers. A 20-something stoner and guitarist with a wispy mustache, nothing more than a handful of resentful blonde hairs with their own unique tra trajectories. A manic pixie waif who is incorporating clown work into her burlesque routine. A middle-aged divorcee whose IMDb page reads like an alphabet soup of early 2000s police procedurals. CSI, NCIS, SBU. And me, a PhD in theater who has abandoned academia because I couldn't find a job. 20 eclectic strangers who have made the conscious choice to subject ourselves to the sort of thing that will surely make us the laughing stock of our family's Thanksgiving dinners. Why would we do this to ourselves? Some people believe that actors get into acting because they feel everything so deeply. You're too sensitive, many of my exes have told me, and my wife, <laughs> and my parents, and probably someday my daughter. But I think actors get into acting because they don't feel enough. But performing gave me an opportunity to explore emotion in a way I never could in real life, and I ran with it. Growing up, my household was not a place where emotional spelunking was rewarded. If you were to lift a corner of a rug in our house, you'd find decades-old feelings swept under there, left to molder with the dust bunnies and the silverfish. So just as I got into acting because I didn't feel enough, I think I got into clowning because I felt fundamentally Unfun. On the first day of clown college, Zach tells us to abandon any pretense of perfection. This is going to be messy, uncomfortable, and challenging. Later I realized he wasn't joking. After several classes spent wiggling around like over-caffeinated salamanders, singing improvised, unrhymable songs about our deepest fears, and screaming like banshees into the abyss, Zach informs us that we are going to do something big. Our instruction, lie on the ground. Close our eyes, forget everything. Easy. Forget everything you know about yourself, about the world, about existence. If you think of something while lying there, your task is to forget it. Uh, but what if we forget what we're supposed to be doing? I asked flippantly. <laughs> Zach, a seasoned veteran in dealing with literal class clowns, intones, that's the point. We lay there, actively forgetting, and after nearly an hour of memory genocide, Zach quietly instructs us, now slowly, very slowly, start to learn things again. Start with the smallest things about your body, and go from there. A room full of mostly employed adults proceed to slowly, very slowly, 
rediscover how to move their bodies. Little things. Eyelids. Fingers. Foot fingers. <laughs> Eventually, we learn to wiggle on the floor, to roll over, to crawl. Some of us learn to walk, but not all of us. A rudimentary language develops. It begins with grunts, pants, hoots, howls, laughter. A comprehensive language like English never emerges. We don't have the luxury of thousands of years of cultural evolution needed to develop such complex linguistic forms. So as we grunt at each other and stick out our tongues, Zach gingerly places red ball noses on our faces one by one, and thus our primordial clown selves are born. <laughs> The whole exercise lasts nearly four hours. At one point, I discover a small pebble on the floor and realize that if I blow on it, it moves. This fascinates me. I spend probably 20 minutes blowing this pebble across the room. I can't be sure the exact time because, of course, I have forgotten what time is. But this pebble is thrilling. For a moment, I forget myself entirely, and I am just having fun blowing on a pebble. It's the most fun I've ever had in my two and a half hours of this new life. When class ends, I walk to my car, broken glass from a recent break in crunching beneath my feet, and wonder why I can't find the same freedom and joy in my own life. How could a pebble be so fun? Later I learn that we all have a clown in us. It's our pre-socialized selves. It's a version of ourselves with no superego, no gender, no shame, who doesn't worry about the things we've been taught to worry about. Clowns are us without the masks we wear to fit in. They just want to have fun at all costs. And clowns generally don't talk, at least not in any significant way. Language is complicated. Clowns are not. Words have too many rules. It gets in the way of the fun. I don't like this. I thrive on words. I don't understand how to express myself without them. Clowns don't need language to communicate. They, they communicate by being fully in the moment. This is madness. But Zach told us it would be hard. A later class. Zach places his shoe in the center of the room. It is not a clown shoe. It's a white K-Swiss, dirty by years of vigorous clown educating. He explains the assignment. One student will step outside the class and, when prompted, will re-enter wearing their bright red clown nose. There is to be no talking. Once you enter, you take a moment, check in with your audience, just look at them, get a sense of how they feel about you. If you feel the audience loves you, you know, if they smile or better yet laugh, you take a step towards the shoe. If you feel anything but love, and this covers a wide range from mild apathy to outright loathing, you take a step away from the shoe. Then repeat until hopefully you get the shoe. That's it. Several students try to get the shoe. Most try too hard to make us laugh and we resent them for their pandering, so they're forced to retreat. Nobody gets the shoe. Now it's my turn. I leave the room, closing the door behind me and affix my rubbery red prosthesis. I turn, take a bracing breath, and open the door, stepping into the room as my clown looking at my audience with hope in my eyes. There is a huge laugh. Wow, they love me. I take a genuinely surprised step towards the shoe. A bigger laugh. An even bigger step this time. I check in. The biggest laugh yet. Huh. I'm not doing anything. Why are they laughing so much? Soon I'm closer to the shoe than any student has gotten. I may be two steps away. Every step I've taken has been met with a great peal of laughter, so clearly, something must be wrong. Then it dawns on me. They're fucking with me. <laughs> Doubt clouds my confidence as I step away from the shoe. The audience looks confused. Why am I stepping away if they laughed? Their confused faces prompt another step backward, and another, and another until I am back through the door. I let it shut and stand in the darkened hallway, defeated. Clown! Zach bellows from the room. Get in here, clown! I dutifully step back through the door, my nose hanging pitifully around my neck. What the fuck was that? Zach demands. My face burns with embarrassment. Why did you back up? You were right there, Zach, please. 
I battled the truth as it comes to me. I thought uh, I thought maybe while I was in the hallway, you had maybe uh, told everyone to just pretend to love me and, and laugh at everything I did, no matter what. Why would I do that? Like a test, to, a test to see if I could tell if the audience really loved me or if they were just faking it, uh, to see if I'd know when to really step forward. My therapist would have a fucking fear <laughs> That's the single most insane thing I've ever heard, Zach sneers. There is a special kind of sting when a clown college instructor singles you out as an oddity. Why would I do that, he repeats. I don't have an answer. There is no reason. Their laughter was genuine. My clown deserved to get the shoe, deserved to have fun, but I got in their way. I sabotaged myself. I take my seat. Other students go up, but nobody makes it to the shoe. Of course, the shoe isn't the point. The shoe is just a thing, an artificial goal, something we're told we should want. The important part is the space between the door and the shoe. Being present, having fun. In a later class, we do an activity meant to ground us in the present. Two red-nosed students will stand next to each other, holding hands, and for once our clowns will be allowed to speak to each other. But our vocabulary will be limited to the immediate now and must begin with, I feel. I feel awkward. I feel silly. I feel like I may have made a mistake getting a PhD in theater, that sort of thing. <laughs> the idea is to dive into your true self without censoring. What you say as your clown should be a reflection of your immediate inner truth. A young Korean-American woman holds hands with a young white man, a privileged guy for whom clown college feels like the sort of fuck you to his parents. <laughs> The kind of guy who probably refers to himself unironically as a capital N nice guy and bemoans the pushback against chivalry. They begin to alternate their I feel sentiments. Nothing remarkable happens until he repeats her acknowledgement of I feel awkward. I feel awkward, he says. I feel like you're copying me, she says. I feel like you're being aggressive, he says. A few rounds of exponentially hostile banter. They're both getting she says quietly, I feel like you're an entitled asshole. <laughs> Silence. Then in this, our second to last class in clown college, where for weeks we have made elephant noises and wiggled our feet fingers, he says, spit foaming in the corners of his mouth, you're a cunt. <laughs> they are still holding hands. <laughs> And there it is, one clown just called another clown a cunt. <laughs> the tension in the air is as thick as lemon meringue pie. I can hear the steam escaping from his ears. He's sweating, a droplet having made its way onto his clown nose, around the bulbous front, dangling between the two carved nostrils. The entire class falls silent as our collective jaws drop. Zach breaks the hostile silence. You didn't say I feel. <laughs> the exercise continues, but the sweaty, frothy young man has run out of steam. He showed his true self, and he has nothing left to give. His attempts at insults grow increasingly impotent. The young one sees his weakness and begins to utterly destroy him with each I feel. I watch in awe as she emotionally eviscerates this pathetic, <laughs> wet man-child. It is a thing of beauty. She has turned her clown into a weapon, and she is having fun. <laughs> he is not. This is the single greatest thing I have ever witnessed. I am in utter awe of the absurdity of this moment. Her clown strips him down to a quivering husk of a clown. Her killing strike? Very simple. I feel great. <laughs> he doesn't show up to the final class. I assume he fails clown college. All the clown wants is to have fun. The rebirth exercise, the shoe, the holding hands, these are meant to remind us to find joy in the present, to not be suffocated by the pressures we placed upon ourselves, to fan our inner spark into a blazing bonfire of celebration. After watching that young woman discover her clown, my clown begins to take shape, and my clown is dumb. They're really fucking dumb. My inner clown loves the dumbest things, like 
like blowing on pebbles. <laughs> but what they love most is awkwardness. I hate awkwardness, but my clown revels in it. It fills them with awe, and slowly I learn to bring this joy into my everyday life, to let my clown into my reality just without the nose. To find joy in discomfort, to be happy being dumb. I spend years learning how to speak the same language as my clown. It's wildly difficult desocializing yourself, but I have found a means. One day after it rains, my two-year-old daughter is stomping in the shallow puddles when she reaches down and tries to pick up some water, mining or shoving it into her pocket. I ask her what she's doing. I'm putting raindrops in my pockets, she beams. For later. Her clown is a lot of fun. She can take a great big step towards her shit. Thank you. AJ Knox, ladies and gentlemen. AJ Knox.